بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد إسلام الفوبيا الفوبيا of Islam a phobia translates as an irrational fear as a stigma a hatred a revulsion that comes out of the depths of the heart without any logical or sane reason and I think it is very apt to describe the type of hatred that some people have of our religion as being an Islamophobia it is a phobia of anything that is Islam. There are people who consider that this religion cannot be anything but evil. And that it is simply impossible for there to be average Muslims. For there to be peaceful Muslims. For there to be a reality show that is just as boring and just as and just as plain and simple as every other reality show out there because it shows Muslims in their daily life. And so because this all-American Muslim reality show depicts the most boring set of people imaginable without showing bombs and terrorism, people get this impression that we're not being fair by showing a set of Muslims that are peaceful and we have major corporations boycotting the show out of this fear of portraying peaceful Muslims. We have over 22 cases of mosques being prevented to be built in this land. We have over 17 states in our own country that have banned or outlawed the practice of the Sharia ah, as if somehow the Sharia ah were a viable realistic threat. In other lands around the world, we have had the banning of the building of minarets. We have had the banning of Muslim women wearing the burqa and the veil. And the irony of ironies is that these Western lands, these lands of democracy and freedom, they used to pride themselves on allowing individuals to be whoever they are. That was what made the West different from everybody else. That was what differentiated, you know, in the 80s and the 70s, when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, we had this system, you probably haven't heard of it, of dividing the world into first world and second world and third world. You've heard of this? This, this tripartite division of the world? And the first world was only those worlds or those lands that gave freedom to their people. And the third worlds were everybody else who didn't give any freedoms to their people. And this part of the world valued itself that yes, we allow our citizens to do as they please, to worship or not to worship, to live whatever lifestyle they like. And this was a value that these countries and societies have fought for for over 300 years. Look at the history of this land. Look at the Puritans when they migrated from England to America. The reason they migrated was that they did not want the government to interfere in their rituals and their private lives. And so they fled seeking the freedom to be religious. That's what the Puritans were. They were fundamentalist fanatics. They were religious people, but they didn't want the governments to be involved in their religion. So they fled their lands and they came to this land seeking those freedoms. Similarly in Europe as well. After Europe was immersed in hundreds of years of civil wars between Protestants and Catholics and between factions of Protestants, the 100-year war, the 30-year war, finally they realized, you know what? The only way forward is to stop fighting over religion and to live and to let live. To let every person worship as he or she, she, she chooses to worship. So they fought for these freedoms and they prided themselves on these freedoms. And all of this actually began 800 years ago with that famous document called the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was the very first document, the very first constitution, if you like, even though to call it a constitution is a bit stretching it, but it was the very first uber constitution, if you like, that was applied upon the kings and queens of Europe. And there is a theory there is a theory that the Magna Carta came out of the interaction 
of the crusaders with Muslims that when the crusaders returned from Jerusalem and they saw that Muslims had a law in which the Khalifa was also subject to that law just like the states and the citizens of the state were subject to the law there was a law higher than the Khalifa they realized that this was the way forward and so the Magna Carta came out of this realization that there should be a law that even the kings and queens are subject to and of the paragraphs of the Magna Carta of the paragraphs of the Magna Carta and this document is 850 years old one paragraph in it gives people, and listen to this, we're getting very relevant here. I know I think you think I'm talking about something very ancient. We're going to fast forward to last week. This Magna Carta document talks about the right of habeas corpus. How many of you know what habeas corpus is? Every one of you should know what habeas corpus is. It is what differentiates, and here is what I, I am saying this. It is what differentiates a free society from a repressive one. It is what differentiates a democratic society from a tyrannical fascist one. The right of habeas corpus, basically to be simplistic here, I know some of the lawyers in the room are not going to like this simplicity, but just to get the point across. The right of habeas corpus means that the king, the ruler, the government does not have any right to imprison or execute or confiscate anything belonging to a citizen without due process of law. If the king doesn't like the way you look, that doesn't justify him taking your property. If the king doesn't like you saying something, he can't just lock you up in jail for 20 years, as is the case in many repressive regimes across the world. Even if the president wants to do something, he has to go through a court of law, and there has to be an open and fair process where the person is able to defend himself, and a neutral party will judge between even the president and the citizen. This is the right of habeas corpus, that no one can be detained without subject, without a due process of law. And this was the cornerstone of Western society for 850 years. Notice I said this was the cornerstone. Because something happened last week that unfortunately many Muslims co completely went under their radar. And it is something that every one of us should be alarmed about. Because it signals the beginning of the end of these freedoms that we cherish so much. Last week, our Congress and then our Senate overwhelmingly ratified a new law. And it is now on the President's desk and every indication is that he is going to sign it. And it is pretty clear he is going to sign it. A new law that allows the President to decide that if a enemy combatant who might even be a citizen is deemed to be a terrorist threat that this person can be detained and questioned and interrogated and imprisoned for an indefinite amount of time no questions asked the right of habeas corpus which was guaranteed in every single western land for over 800 years is now going to be diminished and taken away. And you know, when people are willing to give up their own freedoms and their own privileges that they have fought hundreds of years to achieve, just because they don't want us, the other, to enjoy those freedoms. When a group of people are willing to go against their own heritage, and their own background, and their own values, and their own laws, merely because they hate another group of people, then wallahi, if this isn't a phobia, I don't know what a phobia is. And this is the essence of Islamophobia. They're so paranoid, they're so crazy, they're willing to go against their own values, and begin detaining innocent people began assassinating their own citizen without any due process of law. And if this is happening in our times, then we need to realize that this is not the first time that such hatred has been exhibited. It is not the first time that a group of people 
have contravened their own ethics and their own system of government. In fact, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the very first subject, the very first person who was attacked by what we now call Islamophobia. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi society, the Quraysh of Mecca, was the first society that was willing to go against their own principles and to contradict everything they believed in merely because they hated this man and his message. The Prophet Sallallahu lived in a tribal society. There was no Magna Carta. There was no constitution. There was no civil law and ordinance. No. There was but one law. The law of the tribe. Tribalism. If you belong to the Quraysh, you're set for life. No one can touch you and harm you. The Quraysh are the elite. The creme de la creme. Nobody can do anything. The Quraysh have the right to usurp to kill, to do whatever they want, and nobody can harm them in return. And if you're a member of the Quraysh, then you have lifelong membership, because membership is by blood, and nobody can change your blood. If you're born a Qurashi, you're gonna remain a Qurashi till you die. Nobody can take that right away, because your father and your grandfather were Qurashis. This was their law. Well, guess what? When the Prophet ﷺ came along, and he wasn't just any Quraysh, he was the Banu Hashim. And the Banu Hashim are the greatest of the Quraysh. And they are the custodians of the Kaaba. And they are the ones who are feeding the pilgrims water. And they are the ones who are in charge of so many things. The Banu Hashim are the elite amongst the elite. And he wasn't just any odd member of the Banu Hashim. He was the grandson of none other than Abdul Muttalib. And do you know who Abdul Muttalib was? If there ever was a legend in Arabia, it was Abdul Muttalib. If there was ever a man whom all the Arabs united in their pride that this man was an Arab, it was Abdul Muttalib. The man whom Allah miraculously allowed the Kaaba to be saved in his reign. When the elephants attacked, it was Abdul Muttalib who made dua to Allah to protect the Kaaba. The one who rediscovered the well of Zamzam and so many other miracles happened in Abdul Muttalib's reign. If the Arabs could have ever had a king, it would have been Abdul Muttalib. That's how close they came. And so this man, the Prophet Muhammad wasn't just any Qurashi. He wasn't just any Banu Hashim. He was the direct grandson, the favorite born grandson of the favorite son of Abdul Muttalib himself. No one had a more noble lineage than he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet, when he started his message, you know, when he began preaching, the very first story, you know, when he ran back to Khadija, Khadija took him to Waraqa ibn Nawfal. What did Waraqa tell him? How I wish I were a young man to defend and protect you when your own nation will cause you to go into exile and expel you. Waraqa predicted this, that your own nation will go against its own ideals. Your own nation will forget its own laws that it cherishes. And the Prophet ﷺ was shocked because he loved his people. And he said, my own people will expel me. He couldn't understand. How could they? I'm a Qurashi. I'm a part of them. How can my nation hate me? And Waraqa said, never has any man come with your message of worshipping Allah, of living a peaceful life, of giving the rights to the poor, even if it's against the rich. Never has anybody come with your beautiful religion, except that the people have opposed that religion, and you're not going to be any exception. And that is exactly what happened. That the Quraysh began spreading lies and innuendos, slander, began smearing the Prophet wasallam, saying the worst things about him. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, when somebody says something about you that's not true, when somebody slanders you and your character, when an acquaintance, when you go to a party, you go, then somebody says, oh, you know, somebody said this and that about you. Even though they shouldn't have come back and told you, because that's also bad. But when somebody does tell you, what happens to your heart? Doesn't it feel as if there's a constriction? Doesn't it feel as if, how could they say that about me? How could they lie? How could they ruin my character? And it's difficult to eat and drink. It's difficult to go to sleep at night. 
You feel constriction because people are ruining your character. And this is about matters of this world, petty issues. How do you think our Prophet Muhammad felt when the slander wasn't just about petty issues, but the slander was about his entire character, his entire message, his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't you think he felt grieved, saddened, distressed, hurt? Or do you think that he was superhuman and he didn't feel any of this? Let us look at the Quran. Because for sure, the Prophet did not whine and moan and complain to other people. For sure, the Prophet did not have a victim mentality. Oh, woe is me, look at what's happening to us, everybody's again. No, the Prophet was a man and he took everything in stride. And he didn't show any weakness to anybody, but inside of himself. How do you think he felt about what his own people were saying about him? Allah tells us in the Quran. Allah tells us in the Quran. وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ We know, Ya Rasulullah, we know that your heart is constrained because of what they're saying about you. We know, Ya Rasulullah, that your heart is constrained. It's difficult. It's not at ease because of what they're saying about you. So, point number one, to feel distress and grief, to feel hurt, to feel inexplicable anguish, to feel this, this, this frustration. Alhamdulillah, you're in good hands. The Prophet felt it as well. Relax, because the Prophet felt the same way. And in fact, let me go further than this. To feel that frustration, when you see the slander around you, when you see the people portraying your religion in this manner, when you hear these political pundits and these self-appointed media experts about Islam pontificate about this imaginary religion that they've invented, a figment of their concocted imagination, when you hear people like this and you feel this sense of rage coming up, first realize that that rage, that anger, that frustration is stemming from Iman. Feel happy that you feel this frustration. Why do I say this? Because if you didn't care about Islam, well then you wouldn't feel frustrated, would you? If you didn't have a love of the religion, you couldn't care less. The very fact that you feel asphyxiated, the very fact that you want to stand up and do something, positive and productive inshallah, you want to do something, that's a positive sign. That's a good sign. And it is a sign of Iman. So, feeling frustrated should actually make you happy that you have Iman. Alhamdulillah. Because if you didn't feel frustrated, this is a very bad sign. If somebody, a'udhu billah, cursed your mother, somebody insulted your father, what would you do? You couldn't stand that insult. You'd be angry. So when our Prophet ﷺ is ridiculed, to feel that frustration and anger is a sign of iman. But number two, what do you do with that anger? What do you do with that frustration? Are you going to go channel it into something haram, into something, a'udhu billah, violent and militant and terrorist, ter terroristic? like one out of every two million kids does. Because it is true that yes, call it FBI entrapment, call it ensnarement, but there are those people out there who want to bomb New York Times, who want to wear underwear bombs and try to bomb planes, right? I mean, let's not deny they exist, they do exist. And even if it's one out of three million, those one out of three million irritate and hurt all of us three million people out there. Their anger is shown or is manifested in a haram manner, in an illegal manner, in a counterproductive manner. Obviously, they went down the wrong path. So then what is the right path? Well, again, let us look at the Prophet Sallallahu And let us look at what Allah tells him to do. Because brothers and sisters realize that when we say the Prophet is a role model, what that means is Let's study what he did. Let's examine his life and times. Let's not just talk in slogans. We need to move beyond slogans now. If he truly is a role model, well then, me and you, we all need to be studying his life, seeing what he did to battle that Islamophobia. And therefore, in the short talk that I have today remaining, I want to talk about 
one surah that Allah revealed specifically for Islamophobia. A very early surah. In fact, perhaps it is true to say the first surah in the Quran that came down to address the phenomenon of Islamophobia. It is one of the first surahs ever revealed in the first three years of the da'wah in Mecca. And the very first instance of the Prophet ﷺ feeling frustration, feeling this, this, this sense of anxiety. How could my people say this about me? How can they spread these slanders about me? Allah revealed a small surah, one that we recite all the time. But its meanings are so deep and profound, so relevant in our times of Islamophobia. It is Surat Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. Surat Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. This surah was revealed as a response to the first case of Islamophobia in the world. Now that we're facing the 10 millionth case of Islamophobia, Surely we need to go back to this surah and look at our lives in light of this surah and look at the advice the Prophet ﷺ was given and let us see if we are applying that advice as well. So very briefly, commenting on this surah. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Have we not opened up your chest? Have we not lifted the burden that was causing your back to bow down, lifted this burden off of you. Have we not raised your mention? You are mentioned frequently. The surah begins with three rhetorical questions. Have we not opened your chest? Have we not lifted the burden off of your back that was causing your back to become crunched? And have we not raised your remembrance? Three rhetorical questions. What is the function of a rhetorical question? When is a rhetorical question used? A rhetorical question is used to state the obvious that has been forgotten for or ignored for a temporary reason. A rhetorical question is used to emphasize the known that has been overlooked. So for example, if the students get rowdy in a class, the teacher bangs on the desk and says, am I not your teacher? If the teenager talks back to the father, the father says, am I not your father? The teenager had better not say, oh, I don't know, maybe you are. No, no, no. You don't, you don't answer a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is meant to emphasize the obvious when it has been overlooked, right? So when the teenager talks back, the father is saying, put yourself in place. I'm your father. When the students get rowdy, the teacher is saying, hey, check, I'm your teacher. The purpose of a rhetorical question is to remind the one who is questioned of something that is well known and obvious, but has been overlooked. So the surah begins by Allah reminding our Rasul wasallam, of three things. What is the first? Have we not opened your chest? The meaning of opening the chest is actually an Arabic expression. Like we have in English, he was caught red-handed. It's an expression. It's a metaphoric expression, which means to ease, to bring about peace. This is what sharah al-sadr means, to bring about peace. Have we not given you peace? And Allah himself explains in the Quran, what is the meaning of giving this peace here? Because Allah uses the same phrase to describe the peace. أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Give the example of the one whose heart we opened with Islam. How Allah gives us peace is through Islam. How Allah gives us contentment is through Islam. So the Prophet is being told, have we not given you Islam? Have we not given you Islam? He's being reminded of the greatest blessing and that is the blessing of being a Muslim. The second question, have we not lifted your burden that was causing your back to stoop down? And the scholars have many interpretations, but the main one is, have we not forgiven all of your sins? Those sins that would have otherwise have affected you, we've forgiven all of them. 
And Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Fatih, لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ So that Allah can forgive all of your sins, the past and the present and the previous. All of your sins. So have we not forgiven all of your sins? And the third question, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ Have we not raised your remembrance? Meaning, have we not caused you to be remembered more than any other human being? Never is Allah mentioned except that the Prophet Muhammad follows along. In the shahada, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. In the adhan and the iqama, in the salawat, in the khutab and durus, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Never is Allah mentioned except that the Prophet follows along after that. Wa rafa'na laka dhikrak. We have raised your remembrance. So the Prophet is being reminded of three things that he has overlooked. Have we not opened your chest? And by the way, there's a literal meaning here as well, because as you all know, when the Prophet was four years old, his chest was literally opened. So there's a literal meaning, have we not opened your chest and cleansed your heart? And there's a symbolic meaning, have we not given you Islam? Alam nashrah laka sadra. And then, have we not forgiven your sins? These sins that would have otherwise irritated you? Have we not raised your remembrance to be the single most beloved and respected and admired human being in human history? The answers to all of those questions don't need a response. The Prophet is being told, look at these blessings. How could you get bogged down by the slanders and insinuations. Look at all of these blessings Allah has given you. Why are you grieved and worried about what they say? You're a Muslim whose sins have been forgiven and whose ranks has been exalted. Now, there's no question that our Prophet Sallallahu has the perfection of these three characteristics. No one is a better Muslim than he. No one has had his sins forgiven like him. And no one's rank is raised like the Prophet ﷺ. However, listen to this now and listen carefully. Every one of us, by virtue of the fact that we are followers of Rasulullah ﷺ, we share an infinitesimal, minuscule amount of all of these blessings. Any blessing that our Rasul has been given, take this as a rule. Any blessing that he has been given, because we are his ummah, then we share a minuscule percentage, a tiny fraction of those blessings. Every fadila to him is a fadila for us. Every blessing to him is a blessing for us because we are his followers, we are his people, we are his ummah. Alhamdulillah for that. So, these three blessings apply to us as well, even though in an infinitesimally smaller manner. Every one of us, we can attain peace through Islam. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Every one of us can have our sins forgiven if we perfect the religion of Islam. Every one of us can leave an eternal legacy through our good deeds and our virtues. Those who don't have good deeds will not have any dhikr in the akhirah, will not have any remembrance in the akhirah. But those who have a legacy of good deeds, they will be raised up in Jannah and they will have an eternal dhikr in Jannah because of their legacy. So an infinitesimally minuscule percentage of all of these blessings can also apply to me and you if we perfect our religion. So the Prophet is being reminded that look Ya Rasulullah, you have these huge blessings. We therefore should also be reminded, so what if they say this about Islam? Thank Allah you're a Muslim. Thank Allah you have a means of being forgiven. Thank Allah you can live an eternal life of peace and satisfaction. And those who ridicule this religion and die in that state can never live that life of peace in this world or peace in the next. Look at the spiritual blessings you have and thank Allah and rejoice in those blessings. Allah is telling us in the Quran, say, 
by the blessings of Allah and His mercy. Rejoice in those blessings. That is better that you're happy in those blessings. And it is better than anything that they can do. So when they speak ill about you and your religion, thank Allah for you and your religion. Thank Allah for your Lord and your Messenger. When they curse your Lord and your Messenger, send praises to Allah and salat upon your Messenger. Because you have the best religion and the best prophet and the best book and the only Lord in existence. That is yours. And as long as you're on that side, who cares about the rest? That's the purpose of these three questions. Put things in perspective. So what if they're doing this? You have all of this good. Once he's reminded of this good, the surah goes on. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا Fa here, fa means therefore. Once you've realized that you have so many blessings, therefore also realize that with every difficulty there will be ease. Indeed, with every difficulty there will be ease. A number of points about these first. Firstly, they're re repeated. As you know, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا They're repeated for reasons. Number one, to emphasize the point. Number two, notice that the word Usr has the Alif Lam attached to it. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ Whereas the word Yusr, which means easiness, has no Alif Lam. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ now, every one of you should know what the Alif Lam means in the Arabic language. What does it mean? Over here it means the definite participle, the. Bayt means house, al-bayt means the house, it's the definite article. Kitab means book, al-kitab means the book. So, what Allah is saying, for every difficulty, a particular difficulty, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ There shall be ease and for the same difficulty there will be another ease as well i.e for every difficulty there are multiple ease and this is why ibn abbas radiallahu ta'ala and said never shall one difficulty win over two ease never shall one difficulty trump Two E's. Also notice, a lot of people misunderstand this verse. A lot of people misunderstand this verse and they think, after every difficulty shall come ease. That's not what the verse says. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا Whenever, and listen to this brothers and sisters, it doesn't just apply to Islamophobia. It doesn't just apply to Islamophobia. It applies to every single musibah, every single trial, every single fitna, every single tribulation, every single monetary loss, financial loss, a loss of a loved one, a divorce, an abuse, a slander, anything bad happens to you, anything bad, realize فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى That when Allah decreed to send down this difficulty, along with that difficulty, He sends down multiple ease and multiple blessings. The problem is, me and you are so narrow-minded, we only concentrate on the negativity, we only look at the evil, and we ignore the good. If we lose a job, we don't think, Alhamdulillah, I have my family. If we fall sick, we don't think, Alhamdulillah, I have my money. No, we only concentrate on the negative. And what Allah is saying, I am never going to send down a difficulty except that I'm going to bless you with multiple eases that you didn't have before the difficulty. For every single trial you face, brothers and sisters, you have to have yaqeen that while that trial is coming down, that trial is surrounded by multiple blessings, but me and you are blind to the blessings and we only appreciate a blessing when it's taken away from us. We only appreciate a blessing when it's taken away from us. So Allah is telling us that this is a difficulty. They're slandering you. They're lying about you. But do realize that along with this difficulty, Allah has blessed you with so many ease, so many things that will calm you down, so many things that will make you a better person. Always look at the bright side of life. Always be an optimist. Optimism is a part of Iman. Do you know that's a hadith? Optimism is a part of Iman. That is a hadith. 
It's a sign of faith to be optimistic. A mu'min is not a pessimist. A mu'min doesn't just look at the negative and, and be morbid. No, a mu'min is always an optimist. And this is what Allah is saying. Don't look at the negative and let that be, let you bog down. No, you need to be positive and proactive and know that whenever Allah has decreed an evil, Allah has also decreed positive along with that. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Three words. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ One of the greatest commentators of the Qur'an, Ibn Ashur, a great scholar from what is now Tunisia, Ibn Ashur. Ibn Ashur writes, these three words are perhaps the most profound and meaningful words in the whole Quran. So much can be derived from them. And because we have so limited time, I cannot talk too much about the various interpretations. I will only leave you with two interpretations and both of them are valid. And this is the beauty of the Quran, that the Quran has multiple interpretations and they're all valid. Multiple understandings, multiple benefits, and they're all valid. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ One meaning, memorize these two meanings, there are more than these two, but I'll give you two. One meaning of فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ is, so, when you have free time, فَرَغْتَ would mean free time. فَارِغْ You know there's an Urdu word as well, فَارِغْ and an Arabic word, فَارِغْ فَارِغْ means you have free time. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Fansab means in this context, in this understanding, fansab means to straighten your back up. I.e., when you finish up doing what you are doing and you now have free time, don't sit back and relax. You have a life ahead of you. You have a job. You have a responsibility. Stand up and do something else. When you finish task A, move on to task B. When you're done with chore A, move on to chore B. When you've given da'wah to one person, go talk to another person. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ And that's what your life is going to be. Your life is not going to be a life of ease and comfort. Your life is not going to be a life of sitting in the bed shrouded in your, in your garment. يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرْ قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Oh you who's wrapped up in a garment, get rid of this garment. Throw away the blanket. Stand up and warn the people. You have a life of action, a life of of activity, not a life of passivity, not a life of sitting back and doing nothing. When you finish one task, move on to the next task. That's your job ahead of you. Notice though, notice, Allah did not tell him the particular task. Why? Because there's too many tasks to do. There's too many tasks to do. And different people have different tasks. For some of us, Preaching and teaching is easier. For others, getting involved in the media is easier. For others, writing public campaigns and letters is easier. For yet others, writing letters to congressmen. For yet others, being good to your neighbors and relatives. Every one of us has multiple tasks to do. So Allah, in His wisdom, does not limit the tasks. He lets it open. Every one of you has got to have multiple tasks. And every time you finish one, move on to the other. Life is too short to waste. You can't just go and do nothing. You need to stand up and be proactive in your community. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Meaning one. That's the first meaning. There's another meaning. Just as beautiful, just as profound. And there are at least 10 other meanings, but we don't have time for this. The second meaning, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you finish your work of da'wah and doing what you're doing, and you get back home, so فَرَغْتَ here means you're done with your daily routine, and you're back in the privacy of your house. Because that's when you're truly فَارِغْ That's when you're truly at peace. فَانْصَبْ Stand up in salah. Do the stuff you need to do in the, in the dunya, but don't forget the deen as well. Do what you need to do to tie the camel, but don't forget to put your trust in Allah. If you have to go and preach and teach, excellent, do that. If you have to write to, to politicians, if you have to speak to the media, if you have to erase public awareness, all of that is good. But when you finish up, don't forget, you have to pray Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. Don't forget, you have to make dua to Allah. Don't forget, you have to have spirituality and a connection with Allah. And herein lies one of the biggest, in my humble opinion, problems of the American scene. Allow me to be blunt here because you all know me, I'm a very blunt person. We don't have time 
for political correctness. We need to, too many things are happening. We need to just call a spade a spade and mention the problems of the ummah frankly. One of the biggest problems we have, the way that I see it, is that these two messages, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Do the deen, do the dunya. These two messages, the first message, spirituality, go come to the masjid, build masajid, pray fast. The second the second message, be politically active, vote, write letters for Congress, go, go preach to the public. These two messages seem to come from two different sets of people. Two people who have very little in common and who rarely meet together. When you go to the masjid and you hear the imam and the sheikh, almost always it's about spirituality. It's about being good in your salah and your tahajjud and your Quran. And that's important and very essential. You need to have that. Then you go other places and other conventions and people are saying, we need to be the American this and right here, and do that. And that person has very little to do with the masjid imam. And the masjid imam has very little to do with those who are involved in the media and whatnot. And the two seem to have completely opposite messages. But our religion is a balance between deen and dunya. Our religion is a complete melding of this whole world. Our religion is فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ You have to do your job. You need to write to your congressman. You need to stand up and preach. You need to be active. You need to be a role model American citizen. But along with all all of that, you also have to have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you finish doing what you need to do for the dunya, don't forget and never forget your deen as well. And that's the second meaning of فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ And the last ayah summarizes it all. Always remember that your ultimate goal is your Lord. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Your ultimate goal is your Lord. And why is he being told this? Because, and this is beautiful, powerful point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you, will bless you based upon your sincerity and your intention. And not based upon the outcome or the fruits or the results. And Allah is the only entity who will do this. Nobody else will judge you based upon your sincerity. If you show up in the exam and you fail the exam, then you beg with the teacher, Oh, I was sincere. I really loved the class. Are you going to pass the exam? No. If you don't do your job at work, but you tell your boss, I was sincere to the company, but you never did anything. Your, your, your boss is not going to care at all. In this dunya, everything is based upon results. There's only one exception and that's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will not care about how effective your campaigns were. Allah will not care if you actually solve the Palestinian crisis or not. If you actually eradicated Islamophobia or not. Allah will care, did you try your best based upon the circumstances and the capabilities that you had? Did you do your utmost? And even if it didn't actually solve the problem, as long as you did what you were required to do, you have succeeded 100 out of 108 plus. wa ila rabbika farghab. Your desire, your intention, your ultimate goal is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as long as that is your ultimate goal, the rest is all irrelevant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you. Brothers and sisters in Islam, to conclude, this surah, this surah, illustrates for us the reality of Islamophobia. In that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in very simple terms, let them bark as loud as they want. You have a treasure that you should be proud of. And that is the treasure of Islam. You have a belief in a Lord that is forgiving and merciful. You have a belief in a prophet that is the best of all prophets. You have a belief in a book that is the divine of all books. Therefore, why are you bogged down? Why are you feeling constrained? Why are you feeling sad? Thank Allah and rejoice in those blessings. And realize, Allah is saying, realize that even if they harm you, even if they hurt you, whatever they do, I'm going to bless you with even more good. If they tighten the screw one, I'll loosen it up too. If they make one thing difficult, I'm going to make it ease two things easier for you. Never will Allah test and try you with more than you can bear. Isn't that true? So whatever comes your way, whatever comes my way, Allah knows we're able to stand up to it.
And then Allah tells us, but that doesn't mean you should have a pessimistic attitude. That doesn't mean you just sit back and be a victim. Oh, whatever they're going to do, they're all kafirs anyway. No, that's not the way you act. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Stand up and do something. Stand up and be proactive. What? Allah doesn't tell us what. Because there's a million things you can do. And we have to do all of them. Every one of us has a role to play. And we have to keep on playing that role. And as we play it, we should never get tired. Every time we finish one deed, we should start another. And every time we finish one deed, we should make dua to Allah to bless us with that deed. And throughout all of this, realize that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah knows that Allah has given me whatever He's given me. I cannot change the world. I cannot solve all of these problems. I cannot with the snap of a finger, you know, uh, cause the Palestinian crisis to be solved. But Allah is not going to ask me if I eradicated Islamophobia. Allah is not going to ask me if all of the evil on the earth was wiped out because of my efforts. Allah will ask me what I did based upon my circumstances and my capabilities and my abilities and my talents that Allah had given me. Allah is only going to ask me what I was capable of doing, whether I did it or not. That's all. And therefore, every one of us has a role to play. And no one amongst us should ever trivialize our role. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the final message is, Every one of us has to stand up and get active, become proactive. In what? I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that. For some of you, it will be volunteering in the Sunday school. For others, it will be appearing in the media. For others, writing letters to the editor. For all of us being ambassadors of mercy of our religion, preaching tolerance, showing our fellow citizens and neighbors the reality of this religion, showing our co-workers the honesty and the ethics of our religion, showing our neighbors, giving them gifts on our Eid, going to their house on our Eid, and giving them sweets and saying, this is our Eid, this is who we are. For every one of us, this is a part of فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ and throughout all of this, having that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we don't have that connection, then not only are all of these efforts not going to be fruitful, but our whole life becomes meaningless. And so when we have Allah, we don't care who is on the other side. And if Allah is on our side, then whoever is on the other side becomes irrelevant and meaningless. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I conclude by reminding myself and you that this religion is based upon two very simple fundamentals. And that is ilm and amal. Know your religion and act upon it. Whatever you know, act upon it. Whatever you learn, implement it in your lives and pass it on to others. If we're able to perfect these simple realities and understand the surah in light of our modern times, insha'Allah ta'ala, we will go a far, far way in battling the Islamophobia of our times. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.